evening and friends. Certainly a privilege to be here tonight in this meeting again, coming in the love of the Lord Jesus to minister to his dear people at so much in need. And may his blessings rest upon each and every one of you. A bad night on the outside, or it seems that way maybe to me being a southerner, but up here it may be all right. I was certainly happy tonight when some of the brethren here at the church come and got me. It's been so nice to me. I appreciate all your kindness. I've got a little Chevrolet truck I've been coming back and forth in, and since I've been here, they come and get me in a big Oldsmobile, so I certainly feel like I've been honored to, to be in your meeting, to be here. We've um, got, I think this will be our last night at the church, and tomorrow night we move over our closing night at the at the hall at, at the Andy Cotter, I believe Johnson City uh, Auditorium. Uh, the brothers announced that I don't know much about the place, and I couldn't find it, I guess. Let's, we look it up tomorrow to know how to get to it. Now, tonight, we are gathered for one sole purpose, and that's to magnify Jesus Christ to the people. I don't know no other alternative that I would be here tonight. <clears throat> I'm a married man, have a family, and I really love my home. What little I get to be in my home, uh, they've moved me up to the new parsonage at the church's parsonage seven years ago when they built it. And I have never eaten one time in the parsonage without the shades and Venetian blinds turned down in the kitchen, the people standing on the porch in the yard and around like that. I've got two children. It's almost neurotic from just all hours of night up to the one of the home. People coming to see their if it's just like from here at Beamington, it wouldn't make much difference. But the whole world, you see. They're gathering in there. I just heard from my wife, and they're sitting in those hotels and motels there from all over the country, everywhere. I want to know just what day, what time Friday morning I'll arrive, you see. And um, you can imagine what it'll be. And then through the holidays, people coming out. And that, we put in the papers not to do it, but people are sick. And they, could you imagine you could could feel at ease in a little baby laying out in the yard, maybe in a car crying. Some old poor sick mother there that maybe a little word of prayer would change the whole situation. The only way to do is just say, just the brother and get me, and I just keep me away from home is the only thing. I, I have to get off somewhere to kind of get it off my mind. It, it, it's not good for you. It's, uh, you keep that up. Jesus told his apostles, we got to come apart into the desert. And... When you're out there, you've got to do something to keep it off your mind. You'd be thinking about it anyhow. And the prayer of the people has such an effect. You believe that? Yes. Certainly. I, or when I return, the Lord willing, I'll be able to tell you experiences of things of that type that uh, uh, I've had experience with. For instance, while it's just on my mind before I turn to my lesson tonight, being that we just got a couple nights together, we're not in no big hurry, are we? So, hey. Uh, I was here just recently, old Brother Bosworth. How many knows F.F. F. Bosworth? Mine, nearly everybody knows him. And uh, he's the, since Mr. Baxter has resigned, he is going into a, some business that he couldn't take care of, of these campaigns, while Mr. Bosworth is the floor manager in the meeting, now in the big meeting. And so, a very dear brother, all sweet, humble, you just love him. I just can't keep from loving Brother Bosworth such a saintly, godly old brother, and he was in Africa, and he was supposed to be on the East Coast, and then we had to go to the West Coast together. That's actually we'd been there once where we had the great meeting, and one night the room had been so crowded all day long, I was just so weary. I, could, I told my wife, I said, if anybody else calls his own Saturday night, I said, tell him to go to church in the morning, and I'll pray for him down there, because I'm just getting so tired, honey. I said, I just can't hold myself together. And getting so nervous, I was just getting upset. Well, she's 35 and completely gray-headed. You can imagine she stands between me and the public there, so you can imagine what it is. And just went gray in the last year or two. But then she got the people away when it cleaned up the room. And after everyone was gone, we just jumped in the car real quick and taking a little ride. 
We went out and blow New Orleans some knobs, not mountains, just kind of little mountains, what we call knobs there, and it's kind of rough along the side. And I was driving along there, and all at once my windshield just become completely white. And I, next thing I knew, she said, Billy, what's the matter with you? And we drove about a mile around those cliffs, and I knew nothing about it. It had been a vision. And I stopped the car real quick. We swept in the wooded country. I said, sweetheart, I got to get out here at the road and pray for Brother Bosworth just at once. I said, I seen him get off of a train at Durban, South Africa. And he was stricken. I seen him pick him up, put him on stretchers, and he's in the hospital. And very seriously, and I must pray for him at once. Well, we stopped the car, and I got outside, went over to the edge of the woods, and knelt down, prayed to God to help brothers. And then that was Saturday night. And the following Sunday night, I hadn't left the house yet, and some friends was in the house. And we had four phones to answer on, and you just about imagine what it is, <laughs> the calls. And that phone only takes long distance. And so they said the Louisville operator of the Western Union was calling. And she said, I went to the phone, and she said, Reverend Bam, I have a telegram from Durban, South Africa, from Mr. Reverend Dr. Lager, and said, Pray for Brother Bosworth at once was stricken after stepping off a train yesterday in the hospital, expecting him to die at any moment. Like that. I said, Operator, could you chase that back and tell me when that left Durban? She said, Yes, sir. She called me in a few moments and told me what time it left Durban. I got off of my travels so many times. The Pan American gives a little chart that gives the hours and so forth. And what had happened, that angel of God had beat that telegram there 24 hours, just exactly. And the time I got a, a call through the next day, the boss was down being healed, was up and going, you see. So he was healed for the telegram to get there. The sovereignty of God, the angel of the Lord, beat the telegram there 24 hours. Oh, it's the past now. We just, we just love him, that's all. I just, with all my heart. Now, as a man, my words are so limited like any other man, but his word is so real and cannot fail. I always like to read some of his words before I say anything about the, the night service. Now, in the second chapter of St. Luke, and beginning with the 25th verse, we read these verses out of God's Word, and then we'll ask him to add his blessing to it, and then we'll, we'll talk a little while and then our prayer line. Now, second chapter, 25th verse, I start reading. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the child was, when he brought the child Jesus to do for him at the custom of the law, then took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. A wonderful text for this time, new tides of the year of Christmas, the Lord Jesus Christ's birth. Shall we speak to him just a moment while we bow our heads? Our loving Father, we thank thee tonight for thy love that sent the Son of God from glory to earth to become sin. And tonight, with our throne blessings in our heart, by his grace, to know that we were sinners. And he came and took our place and died as a sinner, died in my place. He died my death at Calvary. He died all of our deaths at Calvary. And with sin, my, uh, me as a sinner, he represented me in his death at Calvary. He represented every believer tonight in his death at Calvary. And God reconciling us and his love to us raised him up again for our justification. And therefore, being raised up with him, we're seated tonight in heavenly places in Christ Jesus with every blessing that God promised is our redemptive blessings in him. We thank thee for this. And you, by faith, Father, foreseeing it, knowing what would take place, has blessed us together with Christ. 
every blessing that he died for is ours right now. For we're seated in Christ, we're resurrected with Christ, and now we're seated in him as believers in this heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Oh, Father, it shakes our hearts to know. It, uh, the sense mind could not understand it. It's beyond any of our senses to comprehend what this means, that we tonight are now seated in Christ. Every blessing that he died for is ours right now. We have it. Oh, God, help us to have faith tonight, to use your faith, that you said it was ours, and let us claim it tonight, Lord, every God-given privilege that we have. For you have bought us, called us by grace, washed us in the blood of thy Son, the Lord Jesus, and has cleansed us up, filled us with the Holy Spirit, set us in Christ Jesus, here tonight to claim any thing, any redemptive blessing. And our enemy tonight is just a bluff. For Christ robbed him of everything he was at Calvary when he stripped him of everything, power that he ever had. For God was, man was reconciled to God at that time through the blood of Jesus Christ when he fully paid the price and the full supreme offering was made and God was pleased with it. And tonight we're resurrected in him. Now we thank you for this. Knowing this, that no matter what comes or goes, we are in him. Those whom he has justified, he is already glorified. And the Father, in his own faith, believing it will hold to our redemptive blessings and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, foresees us yonder in eternity, glorified together with him with glorified bodies, free from sickness, free from death, and to live with him as his dear beloved children through all ceaseless ages and eons of time to come. Bless us, Lord, tonight. May our hearts be moved as the Holy Spirit comes down the aisles of our being and cleanses us from all doubt and unrighteousness. For we ask it in his name. Amen. <clears throat> now, someone has been asking why I do not pray for more than I do at night. I might explain that just a moment. See, friends, you don't realize what that does to me. How many, how many know that, that vision takes more out of you than anything else that I know of? The prophet Daniel saw one vision and was troubled at his head for many days. Is that right? Look, did you all know that most all poets and prophets and inspired people were considered neurotic, you know, crazy? That's right. Look, for the people here that probably are not Christians, how about the great folk songwriter who gave America some of its most lovely folk songs was Stephen Foster. He wrote the old folks at home, old Kentucky home, Swanee River, many of those, old Black Joe, many of those great inspiring songs. Here not long ago, my old Kentucky home just across the river from me. I was over there studying at the little bench that he exposed or table. It was valued at hundred thousand dollars many years ago when the World's Fair was held at St. Louis, and he was, he, he penned that song. That was his picture, and with his seraphim was supposed to touch him and give him inspiration. I thought, yes, Mr. Foster, you had it here in the head, not in the heart. But if you notice, every time that he would write a song, that inspiration would leave him, he'd get on a drum. And finally, now you don't, just don't condemn the man too quick. Till you understand. Not being what he should, he'd get on a drum. He'd leave that inspiration. And finally, when he came out from under the inspiration one day, called a servant, took a razor, and committed suicide. He didn't know where he was at. Well, you say, yes. How many of you know William Tapper? Many of you know his famous song, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins when sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. I stood by his grave in London, England not long ago. And I looked down there and I thought, yes, Mr. Camper, I just read his history. You know, after he had inspiration and wrote that song, when, he, when he's up there, it's all right. But when he began to come out of it, he tried to find the river to commit suicide. It was too foggy. The driver couldn't get into it. To commit suicide, after writing that famous song, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins when sinners plunge beneath the flood. You say, that's 
forth how thy prophet. When Jonah received inspiration and went into a city that, with a, nearly a million people in it and was so wicked that they were very wicked, and he prophesied with such power after God gave him a message to give the people, when he was anointed prophet to go down there and foretell, within 40 days God would destroy the city. And he went through with such power until they put sackcloth on their animals, where they repented in such a way. And that man went up on the hill and asked God to take his own life and the go little worm to cut the gourd tree down. Is that right? That was prophet. Look at Elijah. He called fire out of the heaven and rain out of the heaven at the same day when it hadn't rained for three years and six months. Killed 400 priests himself that very afternoon. And as soon as the inspiration left him, he ran into the wilderness and wandered out there, not knowing where he was at for 40 days and nights, and God found him pulled back in a cave somewhere. And a small voice said, asked him what he was doing back in that cave. Is that right? That's prophet. See? Inspired. All Christians, most all Christianity, in the way we see it today, is so shallow. It's like bubble dancing. You speak a spirit and know very little of it. That's right. You don't get down and deal with the actual facts of it, you see. That's the reason the theologians today just know it from a word standpoint and they approach it like that with a sense knowledge and know nothing about the indwelling spirit and the power. See? They don't deal with spirit. They just look at it and say, well, I believe it's this. See, you draw your own conceptions. And that's the reason they make such fatal mistakes. Sometimes in the meeting, I say this. Someone said to me, Brother Branham, the re why don't you, I got a little letter here not long ago, and he said, good criticism. He said, Brother Branham, said, your meaning is head and shoulders above anything you've ever seen. But said, the thing of it is, it's you're just so lazy and won't pray for God's sick children. He had to raise up old robbers to pray for his children. He said, oh, will pray for about 500 while you're praying for one. I said, that's true. But Brother Roberts is God's servant, and he's doing just what God told him to do, and I'm doing the same thing, just what God told me to do. That's right. Sure. Brother Roberts, if he's a true man of God, which I believe Brother Roberts is, a real man of God, and then Brother Allen, Brother, all those brothers are real Christian brothers. I believe every one of them. I believe every man that calls on Jesus Christ is my brother. <laughs> yes, sir. And um, I'm right with them 100% to back them up in anything as long as it's in the Bible and right, I'm right behind them. If they get out of the Bible, I still won't condemn them. I love them just the same and go to them and try to see if we can't get the things straightened up. Now, now on these things, but many times in the meetings, I get what goes through the line. Brother Roberts and them, they just real strong. Their, their meetings are faith. It's a, this with real predominating faith. There's a little brother here, a businessman in this city, the name of George Gardner. You talk about a faith, he's got it. <laughs> but what he does, he's just a babe in Christ, and he's not had many ups and downs and knocks, so he just reaches out there by faith and grab it, and it's on God's Word. He says the Word said so, and that settles it. <laughs> that's the way to do it, see? Now, <clears throat> those things, that's the way Brother Roberts does. That's the way Brother Allen does. That's the way Brother Cole does. That's the way they all do, see? It's faith, faith, faith. Well, now, Sometimes the people in the meeting, they get a hold of things that they can't do something. But if you've done something in your life or never done something that you should have done, you could pray over you all you wanted to and know it until you died and it'll never leave you. See? That's true. You're not, see, the before in the meeting is slow, but you have to find the cause before you can find the cure. If you go to a doctor and tell him you're having persistent headaches and he gives you an aspirin and sends you back home, he's not a doctor. He's trying to get rid of you, trying to get you out of the office. If he's a real doctor, he'll take you and examine your blood and your pressure and everything else and hunt until he finds the cause and then start working from there. That's a real doctor, see? But if he just bounces you off like that, that's not a doctor, see? He's not a good doctor anyhow because he should be, his patient should be like his own, his own family that he try to hunt it down and see where it's at. A man's got that thing on his heart. Well, now, that's the same thing here, see? Now, here not long ago, I'll just give you a little case. I'm not taking up too much of the time on these testimonies. Look, a little case is a little woman, a Methodist preacher down in New Albany, Indiana, which is a very dear friend of mine. I had the Baptist Tabernacle in Jeffersonville, and we were brothers if he ever was. And he'd, he'd always, if, if I got a hold of somebody that didn't believe in immersing and wanted to be sprinkled, I'd say, down, I'd say, you go down to his church, Brother Liam, because you make a better member down there, because i say, he's a real man, and he's a man of God. But he believes in sprinkling, and I'm a Baptist. So 
And I'd take him down. If he found somebody, I'd say, now it's awful dry down there, you see. So if I, he'd find somebody that wanted to be immersed instead of being sprinkled, he'd say, go up and see Brother Billy. He'd say, now he'll drown. Gee, he's a bad just but, but we just had a uh, friendship like that with each other. Well, he was a good man. And he said, he said, after I come in here about, been about two years ago, a little over, he said, Billy, all the way around the world you go and then leave your poor brother sit down here. He said, won't you come down and hold a meeting for me? And I said, well, brother, I, when I come home, I, I'm trying to rest my mind and things from the prayer of the sick. He said, well, brother Brandon, he said, but I won't ask you to pray for one person if you just come down and preach for us one night. Well, he had a radio program, and he announced it on the radio that morning, and that night, church about like this, and they were everywhere and out on the streets. And, were, and so when I made the altar call, we had the people up and down the streets for the speakers to accept Christ and so forth. He'd taken me out to come in that night. They held their hands down over the window and picked me up. And, to, and we're going out, he took me down a basement and said, wait till they get away, and I'll put you in a room down here, and then and you can get out. And I said, all right. Going down the steps, he put his arm around me and said, Billy, you forgive me for something? I said, what did you do, Brother Johnson? He said, well, he said, nothing, but said, I've got a, a little lady here as a Sunday school teacher. And said, she... She's so awful bad condition, nervous, that I'm... Well, if you, you, you don't have to see any vision, so just put your hands on her all for prayer. Said she's been everywhere prayed for, and I said, sure. Said she's in a terrible shape. Said 10 years nearly she's been going to this psychiatrist, $10 a trip in Louisville, and said she's having an awful time. I said, certainly. I walked down to the bottom of the steps, and a very attractive little woman, about 30, standing there, and she said, how do you, Brother Branham? Well, I was expecting to see somebody in a straitjacket the way he was talking and he said uh, I said are you the patient she said yes sir I am brother Bram I said what's the matter sister she said I don't know that's what I'm wondering she said I just I just feel like I'm walking on the earth it's going to burst any time and I can't leave home somebody's got to go with me I'm, I'm afraid to step said I got three little children and said I'm, I'm in an awful shape I said will you pray for me and I said yes ma'am I put my hands over on her and I prayed dear heavenly father help this little woman with all my heart I prayed and I went on out then they got me out a little while and I went home. Two days after that, I left for overseas. And while I was overseas, my wife said that poor little thing called about every two or three days. She said, look, if Brother Branham ever has a meeting anywhere or when he's home, if the angel of the Lord ever comes near, Miss Branham, will you please let me be first one on the list? And said, well, she said, I'll, I'll do my best, sister. said, all I know to do. And she said, oh, she said, I'm just getting worse and worse all the time. And she said, I can't go to one of the meetings. She said, I don't know how they do. They'd have to strap me in a car to get me out. I said, I, I, that's a terrible fix to be. That's the worst thing there is. That's mentally. So I said, uh, well, uh, my wife said, well, he said, well, when he comes back, well, I come home, she called about every day, said no. And said, it, uh, so she'd come up. And she wanted me to pray for her. I said, all right. And I was going out. They'd taken me out then. And so I stopped there on the sidewalk and prayed for her. She went back couple days later, she called my wife and said, Oh, Sister Brown, it just has to take one anointing is on him where he can rebuke the enemy. He said, I'm dying. He said, I just can't stand it any longer. These 10 years, said, I just can't hold up any longer. I'm just going to pieces. So, poor little thing. And that six, she just imagine how she felt. Well, and one morning there, about 3 o'clock in the morning, he came into the room. And then after daylight come, while well, there's some people outside, she said, my wife come into my room. She said, Billy, had something happened, I said, honey, he's been here ever since early this morning. She said, I thought when I come to this room that there was something strange. And she said, there's some people out there. I said, well, honey, she said, shall I cook you a little breakfast? I said, no, maybe he wants to do something, honey. I said, don't cook my breakfast. She said, Billy, can I call that little woman who knew all of me? I said, what little woman, honey? And she said, the little woman that's been calling me is so nervous down there. And uh, I said, well, it doesn't matter to me. And so she called her. There's a man from the Louisville Baptist Church, one of the Broadway Baptist Church in Louisville that been, was healed that morning with cancer on the spleen. He's just fine, perfectly well. Now, he used to be a big league baseball player. And so then, uh, uh, for the Louisville team. And then when uh, the doctors would get him up there in Louisville. So then she got the little lady up and some people brought her. I said, I want to see her by myself. And she went over into the little dean room. I put her over there so she'd be sure to be by herself. I walked in, and her name is Shane, and she was rubbing her hands like this, sitting there. I walked in, little mother, and I said, how do you do it, lady? And she got up. She said, how do you do? I said, just be seated. 
There's a little stool sitting there, and I just sat down. I said, Now, sister, she said, Oh, Brother Branham, is the, is the angel of the Lord here? I said, Yes, ma'am. She said, Oh, will you cast this evil spirit out of me? I said, Now, just a minute, sister. I said, You have to watch what you're casting out. I said, People with those kind of things can get yourself in trouble with it. Did you know that? How many believe Moses is a prophet? Sure he was. God trusted him, didn't he? He said, go down there and speak to the rock. Is that right? Not smite it, speak to it. And there where the whole God's program, the whole Bible was broke at one time. Moses, instead of speaking to the rock, went down there and got angry with the people and smote the rock. And smote it the second time. Said, you rebels must be fetch water. And he, he got the water. He was a prophet. He could bring it anyhow. Well, it was God's will. That wasn't God's will, was it? But he had power. He was a prophet. And he brought the water anyhow. But God said, come up here, Moses. I'll deal with you now. Is that right? And wouldn't permit him to go. How about Elijah, that young fellow? He was, oh, he oughtn't have felt that way about it. He went bald-headed when he was young. And he was going back after Elijah being taken up, and the little children run behind him and said, oh, bald-head, bald-head, making fun of the man. Oh, he ought, he ought to know better than looks to me like. But that prophet got angry. And he turned around and put a curse on those little children. And two she-bears killed 42 little innocent children just for calling the prophet bald-head. Well, what difference does that make? I don't think that was the nature of the Holy Spirit, but that was an angered prophet. So you have to watch what you're doing. So I said, Sister, let's talk a few minutes. I said, let's just take a little trip. She said, oh, no, I can't take a trip. I said, just a moment, mentally, I, just to get her mind started. And when we started talking, just a few moments, I seen a little car running like that, little one-seated black car. I said, was you ever in an accident, Sister? She said, no, no, I never was in an accident. And then just then, here come across the room again. I said, I see a little car, and oh, a train almost hits it. And she started screaming then. And then, of course, the vision done started. There's no way of stopping it then. So she it said, told her, said, now, you was in a little black car, and you was with a blonde-headed man, and you were coming back from being out and doing wrong, and a train almost hit you. And it told her about her husband. She just got married, and her husband left and went overseas, and she got lonesome, and she started running around with some boy, and he was, she was out with him one night and broke her marriage vow. And on the road home, she, uh, they almost got hit by a train. And when the vision left, the woman was laying on the floor just screaming top of her voice. And my wife come running to the room, and she wanted to know what had happened. She got the girl up, and she said, Oh, Reverend Branham, don't you dare to tell that to nobody. I said, Sister, the only thing you can do is go and confess that to your husband. Make it right. I said, There's your trouble. She said, I have confessed that to God, Brother Bram. I said, it wasn't God you sinned against. You as a married woman, you sinned against your vows. I said, they might pull all on your head but a gallon. They might pray and stomp and kick devils. It'd never make a bit of difference. You got unconfessed sin, you'll stay right there until that thing's made right. I don't care how many prayers of faith or anything else, it'll stay right there. And she said, well, I, uh, I said, you a Sunday school teacher? And she said, she said, well, Brother Bram, I've got to break our home up. I said, now, sister, the only thing I know, that's the truth. Nobody knows that but you and God alone and that boy. She said, that's right. I said, you told your husband that she was out with a boy but never confessed at all. She said, that's right. She said, but I, I can't tell him. She said, I've got three children, Brother Bram, to break my home up. She said, my husband's a deacon down there in the church. And said, if I'd ever tell him that, said it'd break our home up. I said, well, there. she said, oh, that isn't what's bothering me. I said, oh, yes, it is. It's way back in that subconscious there, still cut a streak. I said, there's where it's at right there. It's right. And she said, well, I, I just can't tell him it'd break my home up. I said, well, only thing I can do, sister, there's what he said. You know whether anybody knows about it or not. So our wife, I was going to the next room, said, oh, don't leave, Brother Branham. I said, well, sister, you go get your husband and make that right. She said, I just can't do it. I happened to look, and standing by her side was a black-headed man, kind of wavy hair over to the side like that. And he turned his back, and he had rolled on, he had a Chevrolet sign rolled on his back. And I said, is your husband a tall man with black wavy hair? She said, yes, sir. I said, he works for a Chevrolet company. He said, yes, sir. I said, he has the same thing to confess to you. That's right. I said, he works in a garage, and day before yesterday, he was with a black-headed woman that works in a garage. She's wearing a pink dress, is in a green Chevrolet car. And she broke his marriage vow to you. And not only that, but he's done it before. said, not my husband. He's a deacon in the church. I said, no wonder Brother Johnson's church is not prospering. 
was such as that. And I said, that's it. And she said, not my husband. She resented it. She believed him. She said, not my husband. I said, look, lady, you better go and get your husband. You all get these things straightened up because that's all I know now. I'm just his servant. And I walked out of the room. My wife come back in a few minutes. She said she went over to the phone. And she called him up. Said the women's taking her back down. So she said, what do you think will happen? I said, well, that's up to them. I don't know. But I said, you never, no matter how much you scream, how loud you scream, how much you pray, uh, that devil's got a legal right to stay right there, but, and he'll stay there, too. That's right. He's got a right to stay there. Not only that, but if you're supposed to have done something and didn't do it, he has a legal right of disobedience. So that's what it is. Home in that person, you find out just where that cause is. Then you know where to start for the cure. See? It's unconfessed sin many times. So you have to watch what I say. is stomping this one out and stomping that one out. See? It's right. Faith will move. But not when he's got a legal right. Satan knows what his rights is and what he, he hasn't got a right to. That's right. Clean yourself up before God and come before him pure and holy. Ask them, see. And now, search your life out. Then, after a while here, they come back. She went and got him, and he come up the road in a car. So they stopped and got out, and she said, Honey, I got something to confess to you. And she told him what it was. And he said, And, and you know, wasn't you out? She knew the woman. said, Wasn't you out? He said, no. He said, you was at a certain place at a certain... He said, where have you been? And she, he said, I, she said, I've been up to Brother Branham. He took, he said, honey, that's the honest truth. And said, I'll tell you what. He said, frankly, now I told about him when he was in France and so forth. And he said, I started it. I'm the guilty one. He said, I was the one who started. He said, if you'll forgive me, I'll forgive you. We'll clean ourselves up before God and walk over there and take our little children and live like Christians ought to. There they confessed their sins to each other and to God and got right with God when they walked back up on the porch with the arm around one another, tears rolling down their cheeks. I said, now, now Satan will leave. Now something will take place. And the woman's perfectly normal and well from that minute on, see? There it is. Laying way back in her soul, you see. But it's, it's things that you maybe forgot about, but they're laying there, see? And so forth. My... So many things, friends, that I've seen our Lord Jesus, thousands of those things right on the platform. How many have been in the meetings and seen such as that right on the platform where people would live uh, wrong and things and rebuke their sins? Let's see your hands. People have been in the meetings. Sure. That's what it's for. Now, quickly to our text. And we got about 10 minutes before the prayer line. 15. Notice, a man, Simeon, an old Sage, white beard, man with the long hair, was a teacher in Israel. And he was a great man, had a lot of prestige among the Jews, and the Jews were just about the condition of the church then is just about like it is today. Kind of cold and indifferent. They'd been looking for Christ to come for four thousand years. And little did they think then, when they was in the condition that they was then, that Christ would come then. But Sometimes when you least think, that's when he comes. When you think he isn't coming, that's when he will come. And then in this place, the old fellow went around testifying because one day the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he wasn't going to die until he'd seen the Lord's Christ. And he went around telling everybody that he was going to see the Christ before he died. Now, could you imagine what effect that had on the people, perhaps the scientists and the doctors and and the ministers and so forth. You know what they probably said about the old man? It's something happened in his head. He's look at him here nearly now, around 90 years old, and his white whiskers hanging down. Old man like he is, and even David would expect to see Christ. Look at him here saying that the Holy Ghost told him that he was going to see Christ before he died. Well, that's ridiculous. It brings reproach upon our church. I can just imagine. But he had a real good right to believe it because the Holy Spirit told him he was going to do it. Now, we don't have two Holy Spirits. We only have one. The same Holy Spirit that was on Simeon is the same Holy Spirit that's here tonight. Man go, the Holy Spirit remains just the same. Notice, then we're going to use the word of expectation. Usually you get what you expect to. If you come to church tonight just saying, I'm going over there, and I'm going over there to find something that I know that's wrong. Don't worry. The devil will show you plenty of it. That's right. You usually get what you expect. 
If you come expecting to get a blessing from God, God will see that you get it. What you expect. You say, well, I don't expect it to be. Well, that's the reason it isn't. You've got to believe it. And you believe it to be right. Look at the right thing. Examine it right. Now, Simeon went to... Uh, it was expecting that he was going to see the Christ. No don't make any difference how much people said he was crazy. That didn't bother him one bit. He believed that he was going to see the Christ. So when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, they didn't have television and radio and press like they have today. And probably if they would, they had it, they wouldn't use it for that. But you know God has a way of getting his message out anyhow, don't you think so? So when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, three magis, stargazers, came from the east. They said, we have seen his star in the west. They were in the east, look, the orange or, or east of Jerusalem. So said, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Look, do you believe they actually followed a star? The Bible said they did. Now, I come over every... They kept time than the stars. And no observatory, no scientists. All the people standing up on the watches, looking at every star moving to see what time it was in the night and so forth. Stargazers, there wasn't anyone seen that angel or that star but these magi, or they was expecting to see it. They had read God's prophecy where he spoke to Balaam back there and said there'd be a star out of Jacob rise, and they were looking for it. So that's the reason tonight that people, the American people, are not expecting, they're not looking for a great Holy Ghost pouring out revival, and that's the reason they're not receiving it while it's poured out. They're not expecting it, that's all. They're looking to see a reformation in the church and the people come back and join church and live on out in the world. And that, It's not that age. It's a time where God is filling his people and baptizing them into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the reason they're not expecting it. They're not seeing it. It's going on. So is it possible, like in the meeting, a lady here in the meeting the other night, seeing the light where it was standing here? Well, I said the rest of them did sit. Certainly she could sit and the rest of them not. My, many times. And so then he was expecting to see the Lord Jesus. So the Magi's was expecting to see it. The, and there were some shepherds out there on the hill that saw the angels come or heard them. And they sang, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill towards man. And then he was born in the manger that night. Eight days afterwards, it was a Jewish custom to take the male child to the temple and have it circumcised. And uh, the mother had to offer an offering for her purification. That's the Levitical law. After eight days, she comes up to the temple. I can imagine it being Monday morning. And there are a great host of people. There's about two million people in Israel then or in Palestine. And I suppose they say at least 50 to 100 babies would be born every night. And um, that made a 50 to 100 babies, maybe two or 300 of them. Each day had to come and be circumcised and purification for the mother. And I can look at it being Monday morning. And all it's busy around the temple. Lots of people coming and going. And way down over on the side stands a long line, like a prayer line, of, of women standing there with their little babies in their arms. Coming, some of them, uh, rich babies, had lambs to offer. A peasant's offering was two turtle doves. And so I can look down along the line. I can see the mother standing there with her fine a little baby's clean and neat and little needlework done, you know, around the babies and so forth. I look way down the line and I see a little woman standing down there that all the rest of the women kept their distance from her. That's about the way they do the church today, that believe in the super. They keep their distance. Look, don't have nothing to do with them people. They're not right. They're, they're holy rollers. Don't fool with them. I've sailed the seven seas, traveled around the world three times, and I've never seen a holy roller church yet. Never seen one yet. This a false name the devil tacked on the church of the living God. The 969 different churches are, I have statistics of those churches. It comes from the government each year. And there's not one of them called Holy Rollers. Not one of them. So it's just a scandal name the devil put on. So I can see those women with their nice little babies all in these nice needleworks and so forth and little pink gowns and so forth standing off, holding their lambs and so forth, walking up as the priest was doing the ministering at the altar. And this little girl, she stood out by herself, nobody around her. I can hear someone say, look, it's there. Yeah, that baby was born out of holy wedlock. 
That fellow chose if they're not even married. Look at him there, and that baby was born. Look at it. Uh, that's none but disgrace. Keep your distance. That poor little mother with that little baby in her arms like this, a little veil over her face, maybe rocking a little Polynesian dude like that. What was he dressed in? Swaddling's cloth. Not fine needlework. Swaddling's cloth. Where was he born? In a manger. Why was he born in a manger? Because he was a lamb. Lambs are not born in houses. They're born in mangers, out in straw. He was a lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. And here he was. You know what swaddling's cloth is? It's what they take off the back of the yoke of an ox. In the Orient, I learned that. That where they plow an ox, they put wrap some rags around to keep him rubbing his shoulders. And in the main stalls that night, there was some swaddling's cloth. He didn't even have nothing to put on. We're not worthy of the clothes we got on tonight. And they unwrapped this cloth off the ox neck, yoke of the ox, and wrapped it around the Savior of the world. And here he was, the little mother rocking him, no clothes to put on the little fellow. He humbled himself in the humility of his flesh. And there she had him in her arms, rocking the little fellow like this. Did she come up? What kind of an offering? Two little turtle doves, a peasant, poor. Yet he owned the whole heavens and earth. He was made poor that we through his poverty might be made rich. There she was rocking him in her arms. No matter what they said, in her little heart she knew where that baby come from. That's the way with every divine believer today when they call them holy rollers and fanatics. They know what's in their heart. They know what's taking place. They say, oh, do you believe in that old stuff, divine healing? Don't you worry. You might call them everything you want to, but they know where they're at. They know what they got cradled right here. That's right. Something of peace that passes all understanding. No matter what the world's got to say about it. Praise God. If Jesus Christ had condescended himself and wrapped in swallowing his stand there, be made fun of his little mother standing like that, it's good enough for me. Amen. It's all right. I don't care what the world says. In your heart, you know what it is. Notice, I can see her rocking him. The first thing you know, I can see mother saying, don't get around that woman. Bypass her around. Put her in a bank. See? And there, her standing there rocking a the little fellow, and him looking up his little starry looking eyes, looking to the mother, the very God of heaven, Emmanuel, wrapped in that little swaddling cloth there. He was rocking in her arms with a piece of good from off of this ox's yoke uh, wrapped around him. No doubt, poor little, little woman looked up and seen them other mothers. You know how mothers are about their babies. Looked up and seen them nice little uh, babies all laying neatly in uh, little gowns, little beds and things, ain't like that. And here she was holding this, but in her heart she knew who it was. And then, look, that's looked like a disgraceful sight to the Lord. But wait, there's something going on all of the time. Back over in a prayer room somewhere, I can see old Simeon sitting, reading in the scriptures. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. I hear Simeon say, I wonder who that means. I've been called everything fanatic, holy roller. Said I was gone crazy. The Holy Ghost told me one day I was going to see him when he comes. And I believe it. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastening of our peace up on him. He was reading the scroll. I see him let the scroll together and stick it down in the sack like that. Look, if God made Simeon a promise to see the Savior, God's obligated to see that he sees him. That's right. If the Holy Ghost made the promise, the Holy Ghost has got to see that promise is carried out. If the Holy Ghost made a promise in here, I'm the Lord that healeth thee, he's got to carry that promise out to the letter. That's right. He's got to. How many in here tonight believe in divine healing? Let's see your hand. What makes you believe in divine healing? That David said, when the deep calleth to the deep. If there's a deep in here calling, there's got to be a deep to respond to it somewhere. How many times have I stood in the mountains and watched the rainbows and watched the eagles when he soars into the air and cry like a baby? Why? I'm a lover of nature. When I see those things a while ago, we was at the room where we were at, and they was catching brother here, uh, program here. Coming in is a lovely program tonight. And I appreciate the songs of down from his glory, brother, dedicated to me. And we uh, were sitting there talking. In a few moments, I just rubbed my eyes like that. And our program come on in a few minutes down there. We hadn't turned the radio off yet. An old timber wolf got to howling. <laughs> you talk about crying. I did. See, there's something in that. A deep call us to the deep. In other words, here, before there was a fin on a fish's back, there had to be a water for him to swim in first or he wouldn't have no fin. Is that right? 
before there's a tree to grow on the earth or a flower to grow on the earth, there had to be an earth first or there wouldn't be no flower to, to grow. Is that right? Here some time ago I read where a little boy, a little baby boy, eat the racers off of pencils. He eat the rubber pedal off of a bicycle. And the, they take him to the clinic to find out what's the matter with the little fellow. And they examine him and find out his little body needed sulfur. There was something calling here for sulfur and sulfur's in rubber. Now look, before there can be a call in here for sulfur, there has to be a sulfur to respond to that call. You get what I mean? And as long as you believe in divine healing, there's got to be a fountain open somewhere of divine healing at all. Yes, sir. The Indian, when we first come over here in these New England state church, our forefathers, they found the Indian. They worshipped the sun. They worshipped something while they were human beings, see? And they know there was a deep calling somewhere. They didn't know where it was at, but they were calling for it. And hot and tops in Africa, I meet them packing little mud idols sprinkled in blood. They know there's a God. They just don't know who he is. And they worship something because there's a deep calling to a deep. And if there's a deep calling, there's got to be a deep to respond to it. The Holy Ghost had promised Simeon that he'd see the Master, and here the Master was in the temple at that time. Little did anybody know it but Mary. And here he was sitting back there reading these scrolls. I can see him when he's sitting there. You believe we're led by the Spirit of God? Yeah. Sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. I can see Simeon sitting back there reading the scroll. All at once the Holy Spirit comes and Simeon! He stuck the scroll down in the box, raised up and said, Yes, my Lord. Oh, my. The very promise that he had given was in the building at that time. He said, Get up and walk. I can see Simeon. Don't know where he's going, but he's led by the Holy Spirit. You believe you're led by the Holy Spirit? Here he comes. He don't know where he's going. He don't know where his next move is. He's just walking, led by the Holy Spirit. I can see him walk out into the temple, thousands going in and out. I can see him go to this line where these women are. Holy Ghost lead, lead him right down this line. Here he comes, right down, stops in front of this little disgraceful-looking woman standing there that they called her disgrace, picked up that little treasure and swallowed his cloth. Tears running down his white beard. Praised him up like this and said, Lord, let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. No matter how disgraceful it looked to the rest of them, the Holy Ghost led him straight to the Savior. In the same time, there was an old blind prophetess sitting over there by the name of Anne. We said she was blind, about 80 years old. And there she was sitting over there. She was watching for the coming of the Lord. In the same time, the Holy Ghost struck her. And here she comes, blind. Moving through that crowd. Nobody told her. She's led by the Holy Ghost. Through that crowd, moving around the crowd, the blind woman, and come over a prophet, standing there beside the child, lifted up her hands and blessed God. If the Holy Ghost could lead that blind woman around those people to come to the promise that God had made, the same Holy Ghost that led Simeon and led Anne by a promise of God has led you here tonight. God's under obligation, if you believe in divine healing, to lead you to the fountain that's open. Don't you believe that? Yes, sir. If your hearts are calling, the deep calling to the deep, there's got to be a deep to respond to it. You believe it, and God has led you here for that purpose tonight. You wouldn't have come out on a slick, snowy night like this just to show what kind of clothes you were wearing. You never come here for no other purpose because you believe that God was a healer. And as long as that's in your bosom, God's under obligation to place it before you. Because you're calling for it, and God will place it before you, then it's up to you to whatever you want to do about it. Simeon could have seen him and walked away from it, but he embraced it. And tonight, when the Holy Spirit begins to move through the building in the prayer line, reach out and embrace God's promise. It's for you. It doesn't matter whether you get up here or not. That doesn't have nothing to do with it. Up here, that doesn't have anything. You just embrace it right where you're at. And God's under obligation to bring it to you. Don't you believe that? Led by the Spirit of God. How the spirit filled lives are always led by the Spirit of God. Certainly, I'm going to let you in on this little something now. If you just excuse me for another a few seconds here, a few minutes. I want to say something just now. You believe in being led by the Spirit of God? Here some time ago, I was in, in Arkansas, and I was bring, coming out just when I first started out my meeting. And I was coming out of a place where they was bringing me out of the auditorium at Camden, Arkansas, and the police was bringing me out. And there was the people crying, trying to run through and touch your clothes. You know how people are. And I got a heart, same as anybody else has, and it's going along there. And I heard somebody hollering, Mercy! Mercy! And I looked over to the sign, and there stood an old colored man. They had segregation there, you know. He, just a little white rim of hair around his head, holding his cap like this, saying, Mercy! Mercy! The Holy Spirit said to me, Go over to him. Well, I said to the police, I said, I shall go over. 
said, Reverend Branham, you can't do that. You're in the South. Said, you go over to that colored man. Said, you start a race ride as sure as the world. Said, these white people wouldn't stand for it. I said, I don't care what they think. God Almighty tells me to go to that man. And I started towards him. They run over there and took, pulled a line around. And I heard his wife say to him, said, honey, here comes the parson. <laughs> I went over there. And he, I said, what do you want, uncle? And they formed a ring around like that to keep the people back and people screaming and going on, you know. And so he said, here comes the parson. I walked up to him, still in on him, he just bring me out of the meeting. And so then I got, he said, come over, he says, e -e -e -e, feeling like that, he says, e -e -e, is this you, Parson? He fell around my face. I said, yes, sir. He said, Parson, e is your name Branham? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, Parson Branham, ah, I never heard of you in my life. But said, my old man, he had the same kind of religion you got. Religion, you know, said, the same kind of religion you got. Said her never told me a lie all her life or no one else. Said I've been blind for many years, Parson. And said I live about 200 miles from here. And last night, in the night, I woke up. And said just as clear as I ever seen in my life, there stood my old mammy standing by the side of bed. She said, Honey child, you raise up in here and put on your clothes. And you go down to Camden, Arkansas and ask for a man named Branham. Tell him to pray for you. You get your sight. <laughs> What a feeling. I didn't know nothing to do. I put my hand on the old fellow. I said, God, I don't understand this. Your spirit led me over here. It's led him here. We know not one another, but if thou hast sent him, Lord, then surely you'll confirm your word. I took my hand off. I'm not getting this pushing the old try, trying to break that line and please hold him back like that. And um, to go through, I took my hand down like that. Started back in his eyes. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. His wife said, you see, honey? He said, Sure. Said him, oh, uh, you really see her? He said, sure. Said, see that red car sitting there? Go to that Parson Branham, too. Everybody in the screen. That was all here about two or three years ago. I heard from him. He's preaching the gospel, that old man. Holy meeting. And how I'm led by the Spirit. One day here in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the one just coming the time of when this, uh, uh, this man was healed there. They sent me over to the king of England. And he was saying that Laman was his name. And the meeting was going on. Great signs. You Pentecostal people know how the evangel packed. That piece, and we, the people in there, that little blind girl, when the whole United States examined it, the medical association tuck it up, see where it was right or not, and that little girl by the name of Bethel had been blind. I picked her up in my arms and began to pray for her, and the vision struck and said, Thus saith the Lord. And there she was healed like that, and they even examined it everywhere. They come into the Assembly of God paper, and they come out, and we, the people, that big book, uh, we, the people, wrote ever, goes internationally everywhere. That same meeting, just a little bit after that, there was a man sitting there with multiple sclerosis in his back. And I was sitting there, and they'd been watching. Night was the last night of the service. And they wanted that man to get where I was at. Somebody might have been to Fort Wayne meeting. Old Dr. Bosworth and them was there. And they started taking this meeting, and they put this man in my path. So that he just, he wanted to touch the trouser legs of my, of my trouser legs going out. And the poor fellow laying with a white shirt on, and the people walking over him. I said, what a shame. Don't lay that man there. Pick him up. And then they started putting him back in the chair and just even climbed up on top of the roof. And for all of these, I'm going to forget how many city blocks, 20 some odd city blocks, cars was parked everywhere and people outside standing on the street. He was at the Fort Wayne meeting. Knows what it was. And then when we, that's right, following Paul Rader there, my old friend and so forth. Then when I started, looked out, I seen a vision. A Mr. Lehman, a walking. Not old Mrs. Morgan, Mayo's nurse, give up with cancer years ago, laying on the dead list right now. I go to Louisville, Kentucky, look and see if she hasn't died eight years ago. And come over to Jeffersonville Hospital and look at her nurse now. <laughs> and so she was supposed to die eight years ago, dead, done pronounced dead, and laying there yet still on the dead list in Kentucky of cancer research. And then when she was there, she felt sorry for that man because he was looked so much like her husband. And I've seen a vision of him walking. But in the vision, he told me, go down and pray for that man. And I went out, put my hands up on him, right without a prayer card or anything, walked down and said, the Lord said, lay hands on you, brother, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I walked back up. I seen somebody laying on a cot, just trying to move him over. And a man with arthritis touched me like that and held on to my coat as I was coming by. About four or five days after that, or maybe six days, I give you their address if you want to write to them. This one was a farmer laying there with arthritis, and when the man pulled me, he turned around, I seen him uh, doing something on a farm. I said, you're a farmer. He said, yes, sir. I said, don't worry, for thus saith the Lord, you're going to be well. 
And four days later, Mr. Lehman was going down the road driving his car, and he looked over the field, and here's this farmer sitting out there on a tractor, a running a tractor, and he jumped out of his car, the man jumped off the tractor, they run, grab him one another, lift him one another up and down to praising God, how that the Lord had did it. The next morning, there's so many people gathered in that Indiana hotel where I was staying, that's the reason to keep the place in secret, and the little bellhop come up and said, Preacher, you ever get out through that room this morning? He said, I'll tell you that. So there's just too many standing down there. Well, I wonder how I was going to get that wife and baby there. Mrs. Morgan was with us. And um, I said, well, I don't know. The women will have to have something to eat. And so after a while, another little bellhop come up. said, Preacher, I'll tell you what I do. I can take you down to the basement if you don't mind climbing over some ashes. It'll take you out in the alley as you go out. I said, all right. So he takes us down. We climbed over the ashes and went out through the ash chute in the basement. We was going down the street. And I had my coat up like this. I don't mean don't want to be bad, but you just simply... You, you, you don't realize what a big meeting like that produces. And so I was going down the street, was going to a little place called the Toddles House, where we'd been eating. Morning before there, some great man out of this year, Hudson Bay Company, and, and, uh, sir, and Canada had been healed with a stomach trouble, sitting right in the place when a vision come, told him who he was, and all about it, right there in the, right there in the restaurant, told him he was healed. He said, that's right, sir. I'm traveling through here. So that's exactly my name, and that's where I come from. He said, I've been suffering with stomach trouble. I said, you're healed, sir. He said, well, bless your heart, boy. He come over. I said, you just wait and see. If you, uh, you could go ahead and eat your breakfast, anything you want, because the Lord's made you well. I was going, I started to go down to that same place. The Holy Spirit said, move this way. And I turned down that way. Miss Morgan said, where are you going? My wife said, look, it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. She said, just follow along. So we went along, and I stopped in front of a place called Miller's Cafeteria. I looked up. I thought, well, what am I doing here? And I looked, and there was my wife. Miss Morgan was packing the baby. I said, well, she said, where are you going? I said, let's go in here. So I went in, went out along the side. I picked up all some stuff we was going to eat, went and set it down. And just as I sat down like that, we bowed our head to pray. I heard somebody say, praise the Lord. And Miss Morgan looked over, and there's some, a woman and a man sitting right there. She said, uh-huh, now you're caught, aren't you? And I said, the Lord told me to come here. This lady walked over. She said, Brother Branham, listen. I looked over at the table. There was nothing on the table. And she said, I've been sitting here ever since this opened up this morning. She said, here's my brother. Said the heart is enlarged so big to come through the diaphragm some way. She said, the doctor said that he can't live. Said, we followed you meeting after meeting. So we spent all the money we had. And she said, I sold my cow. We live in Texas. Said, I sold my cow for enough money to bring brother here. Said, we're absolutely, totally broke. And said, I was in such a desperate fix. I prayed last night. Said, all night long, in this morning, said, I fell asleep. And I had a dream. And the Lord told me to come and find Miller's Cafeteria and be here by 9 o'clock. And looked up, and it was just exactly 9 o'clock. You know what happened, don't you? As the brother was healed, he started crying. Like that, and I turned around, didn't want my breakfast, started walking out. Margie, and that's the nurse, and my wife was going out. And I said, something's telling me go outside. And just went outside, a little woman dressed in black, she just fell on the street. Her husband runs this big spaghetti company in Chicago. She's in pretty near every meeting. Maybe here for all I know. She knows here to be here. She, her husband's a multi-millionaire. They were, she'd come from Mayo Brothers, and she was all swelling way out with a malignant cancer, the uh, growth that could not be cured. Mayo's wouldn't even touch it. She said, Brother Branham, she said, I followed meeting after meeting, but she said, I've got in such a place till I can't go any farther. And she said, the strangest thing happened. Said this morning, I dreamed a dream that I should be standing here in front of this cafeteria at 10 minutes after 9. <laughs> there it was. I, that just happens constantly. I went on up to the corner, and my wife said, I said, you go on over to the drugstore and get some little books there for the little kid. So I said, you all go on in, just go on up to you. And I said, I'll be in after a while. I said, he's leading me. I don't know where to go now, but I feel that you all should go go on. So they, they started on, and I stood there. There's some fishing tackling things up there, and I thought I'd go up here and act like I was looking at fishing tackle, and I stand there and didn't see nobody, and I said, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do, Father? I said, what is it you want me to do? He kept praying like that. In a few minutes, he said, go to the corner. I walked out, walked up the corner. You may call this fiction. It's on record, <laughs> and it's on record in heaven, too. And I stood there, and those big Irish cop, I went across the other corner, and I, so the big Irish cop out there blow a whistle, and the pedestrians across and so forth, kept on. I stood there a little while. After a while, another group come across, and way in the back of them was a little woman with one of these little black checkered dresses on a little tan. She had a pocketbook on her arm. She was walking across like this. The Holy Spirit said, come up close to her. I walked up pretty close to her, and she passed like that, went on by, never said a word. Well, I thought, isn't that strange? I never knew that. And she was studying. She had her head down. She just turned. She said, oh, Brother Brandon. 
She looked back like that. And I said, what's the matter, sister? She said, oh, am I dreaming? She said, is it really you, Brother Bram? I said, yes, ma'am. What's the matter, sister? Oh, she said, I said, Brother Bram, I'm from Canada. We only allowed $150 a year of American money. He said, I spent every penny I had. He said, I, I slept in a hotel lobby for two nights. And this morning, I was going over here to hitchhike to go back to Canada. She said, uh, to, on the road, a young woman, not over about 25 years old, 30. She said, I was going back to Canada, hitchhike. And I said, I had five cents for a cup of coffee. And that's the last penny I had. And I was going out that way to hit that highway. And something said, turn around this way and start walking. Oh, my. Those that are children of God are led by the Spirit of God. And she's crossed. I said, what's your trouble, sister? She said, my arm, brother. And she said, look at here. And <laughs> come out like that. Just as normal and straight as it could be. Perfectly normal and well. Oh, he's God tonight. The same one that could lead. Simeon could do the same thing. Just once though, I was crossing, coming from, from Dallas, Texas, from a convention just recently, about, like, about three years ago. I was crossing over, and a storm struck us in a plane, and we were grounded. And they put us in that big hotel there. I couldn't afford to stay in a hotel like that, but... The air service plus uh, Peabody Hotel in, in Memphis, Tennessee. And that night was up there. So now they called us the next morning, said the plane will be ready to leave at 7 o'clock. I'd wrote some letters, anointed some handkerchiefs and so forth, and was going to put it in the mail. So I got up, got the mail, and started down the street. I was going down to put it in the mailbox, and I was going out down there, walking along, and the Holy Spirit said, Stop. Well, I thought that just, I, I just, I just imagined I heard that. Went a little farther, and something began to go. I stopped and I said, Father, what is it that you would have me do? I stepped back up to a place like this, just a little piece from, a, from the post office, and I, I said, what would you have me do, Father? And I stood there about ten minutes. I said, my, it's getting late. What would you have me do? I just stood there a little bit. In fact, I heard something say, turn and go the other way. Well, I walked out and turned. I thought maybe there's somebody coming along there, maybe some trouble. Maybe he bypassed me from an accident. I don't know. I went on, just kept walking, 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 passed on the hotel, walked on down, on down, on down, down towards the river, way down towards uh, the North Memphis there, on down through that way. And I got out amongst the little colored haunts like down there, little houses and things, way down there. And it's coming up just about, the, the sun was way up, way past time for me to catch the plane. I thought, oh my, but the Holy Spirit's still urging me on, go on, move on. I was walking on down the street. I sang that little song you Pentecostal people sing about. There's people almost everywhere whose hearts are all on flame with fire that fell on Pentecost and cleansed and made them clean. You know what I guess. I was trying just to learn it. I said, there are people almost everywhere whose hearts are all on flame. The fire that fell on Pentecost that cleansed and made them clean. Oh, it's burning now within my heart. Oh, glory to his name. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. I was going along saying it like that. I happened to look down there on the street and there around a little whitewash fence an old colored woman, typical Aunt Jemima, about 100 yards from me, had a man's shirt tied around her head like this, and she's leaning over a little old gate like that, and she's looking down the street. I just kind of quit singing, started walking on. I got up there grinning like that, and the big tears on off my big fat cheeks like that. She was kind of grinning at me. She said, Good morning, Parson. I said, Good morning, Auntie. Started walking on like that, and something said to me, I said, Say, what'd you call me? She said, Parson. I said, how'd you know I was a parson? She said, did you ever read that story in the Bible about the Shunammite woman? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I was that kind of a woman. She said, I couldn't have no children. And I promised the Lord if he would give me a child that I would raise it for his glory. So that I was a washwoman. And she said, and I was a Christian. And she said, and I, uh, the Lord gave me a fine boy. And I raised him up. said, but I'm sorry he took the wrong road. And said he took a horrible disease, syphilitic, and said, and he got out amongst the wrong company, and said, and he went so long in getting sick, said, I didn't think of anything like that, till his son eat him, till he's four plus in his blood, and the holes is eat to his heart, until his blood drops back uh, when his heart beats it. And says he's going to die, and said he's laying in there, and he says he's been unconscious for two days, and said, I just couldn't stand to see my baby die like that unsaved. And she said, I prayed all night, and I said, Lord, I was your servant, and you give me this baby, but where's your Elisha? said, oh, what must I do? And said, so this morning, about 4 o'clock, said, the Lord told me in a dream to go and stand at this gate, and said, you'd be coming wearing a brown suit and a brown hat. 
She said, the only thing that I miss is where is that little briefcase that you're supposed to have? And I'd left it in the hotel. <laughs> Don't you believe God still is the same God as with Simeon? I said, my name is Branham, Auntie. She said, Branham? I said, did you ever hear of me? She said, no, sir, don't believe I ever did. And I said, I pray for the sick. She said, you do? And I said, yes. She said, will you come in? And she opened up the gate and it had a chain with an old plow point hanging on it. I don't know where your plow point is. Not keep. And I walked in that little gate. She opened the door, that little old two-room whitewashed cabin down there by the riverbank. And I walked in there. Listen, I... There was a big sign on the door, God bless our home when you come in. No rug on the floor, a little old poster bed, if you know what it is, there, a little iron bed sit, and a big, healthy-looking boy laying there, looked like a way about 180 pounds, about 18, 20 years old, and just carrying on awful, unconscious. No floor on the rug, no rug on the floor, rather, and holes that big in the floor, big cracks like that. I've walked into king's palaces. I've been in some of the most lovely homes there is in the world. But I never was any more, felt any more welcome than I did in that little colored hump that morning. I walked in there knowing that the God of heaven was with us. I didn't know what to do. And he's going, mmm, mmm, ah. He said, it's so dark, it's so dark. Had to cut the, quil the quilt in his hand like he's going, mmm, mmm. And she patted him. She said, Mammy's baby. I thought, yes, in disgrace. Nearly 20 years old, I suppose, and no matter how disgraceful he was, how much trouble he got into, he's still Mammy's baby. That's a mother's love. And if the love of a mother will do that, what will the love of God do? She patted him, kissed him on his forehead. I said, what's he talking about? She said, Parson, he says he's, said he don't know what he's talking about. Says he's been unconscious. The doctor says he ain't going to never wake up. And said, Parson, I just can't see him go like that. Said he keeps saying he's lost out in a big ocean somewhere, and he's in a little boat, and he and it's all dark around. He said, I, that just breaks my heart. She said, You pray that God will save my baby before he die, won't you? I said, Yes, ma'am, Auntie. I said, Shall we bow? And I knelt at the foot of the bed. I took hold of his feet, just as cold as they could be, and um, just like death. And I and she said, She knelt down. I said, You lead us in prayer, Auntie, and you talk about praying. Mm. She got down there just as quiet. She said, now, dear Lord, she said, I stood out there and her back was wet from the dew of that morning. She'd been standing there all that time. God told her she was standing there waiting. Now, I didn't know what to do. So he said, she, she said, dear Lord, she said, don't let my darling baby die in disgrace like that. She said, I want to see him in heaven where he never get in any more troubles. So won't you please, dear Lord, let me hear him say with his own lips that he am saved again. And like at a prayer, and I couldn't keep tears from running down my cheeks. I looked at poor old mammy, and I looked at her, and I thought, oh, God. And when she got through praying like that, she said, will you pray now, Parson, that God save him? I walked over there, laid my hands on his black feet. I said, Heavenly Father, you and your sovereign grace, I don't know why I'm here. I said, my plane's been gone for two hours. I said, why did you bring me down here in this place? And I don't know what to do. It looks like this is where you sent me. But you led me here. I didn't know no more than to come and to think that you would bring me down here to this place. What would you have me to do, dear God? I pray for mercy. Whatever it is you want me to do, I don't know, Lord. What is it you wish? I heard you going, mmm. said, Mammy. She said, what Mammy's baby wants? I said, oh, Mammy. I said, he's getting light here in this room. In five minutes, the man, he is sitting on the side of the bed with his arm around his Mammy, the other arm around me, praising God. About two years later, I pulled in there on a train. I got off to get me a sandwich there. I was going on to California, and I got off a train there and started running down along the place there toward. I heard somebody holler, hello, Parson Branham. I looked around. He's a red cap. He had a big smile on his face. I said, how do you do, sir? He said, don't you know me? And I said, no, I don't. He said, you remember one morning the Holy Spirit led you down to my mammy's house where I was dying? I said, are you that boy? He said, yes. He said, I not only healed, but the, I saved now, Parson Branham. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God to a kind heavenly father that would ground. And listen, when I got back to the hotel, I called him to tell him that I'd be late, and I was just exactly on time. God kept that plane on the ground, and I caught it anyhow. Hallelujah. 
I tell you, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That would save a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Just think of the sovereign grace of God that would ground that airplane up there and the air, ground that plane for the sake of an ignorant colored woman. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord. He's interested in anything that we do for his glory. He's God. His amazing grace is sweet. Oh, how sweet the sound. That saved a poor wretch like me. Yes. Oh, Christians. Oh, I make my heart jump for joy. My mind, how those experiences sweep through my mind. Sure, I'm expecting him. I believe that he's going to do this exceedingly abundantly. I know that he's here tonight. Beyond any shadow of doubt, the same Holy Spirit that led there, that same angel of God, I don't have to wait on him. He's right here now. He's right here anointing me right now. The whole crowd's becoming milky looking over there. That same angel of the Lord. He's here. His love and grace is the same tonight. His attitude towards any person in here is the same as it was towards that poor, eager, colored woman. Yes, sir. Many, many thousands of the others that I could quote. What will it be when I cross over the tide down some of these days and strike the other side and see those dear people face to face when I can sit with them through ceaseless ages talking of the love of God? No wonder his children are crowning King of kings and Lord of lords. He's raised from the dead. He's a living Christ tonight. He's right here in this building now. His power is predominant. His power can do anything that you let it do. Every one of you here, we're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you believe it? We are. The only thing I'm asking you to do is be expecting that you're going to get healed. Believe him you're going to get Do you believe it? Yes. Are you expecting to go out of here tonight well? Certainly. You call a prayer line now. Bring the people up. The people comes up on, the, on this uh, place here. No sign they're going to get healed. There's no sign at all. You don't even have to come up here. The only thing you have to do is to have faith and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that raised from the dead. And He's alive here among us. Amen. He's just as much out there as He is up here. The only thing that's lacking is your faith in Him. Everything that God could do is already done. It's your time to act next. He sent His Son to take your sins. He sent His Son to take your weary. He sent His Son to take your diseases. He take this, sent His Son to heal your afflictions. And Jesus paid the price and put it in Calvary. And the only thing you have to do is look to it. The preacher comes to the Word and preaches it and lays it down and shows you it's God's will. And if you won't take God's Word to me, that would be enough. But I'm not God. God's in His mercy. Besides that, He stands on in the church prophets and teachers and evangelists and everything to get to magnify and get you to the point He's not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. His blessings is for each one of you. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit already moving over that audience right now. Here, I'll tell you something. I won't call a prayer line. I challenge every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ to look this way and to believe that the gospel truth is the truth. How many in here that don't have prayer cards wants to be prayed for? I want somebody that got prayer cards. Raise your hand. All right. You ain't got a prayer card, lady? You want to be prayed for? Sitting right there? I don't stand up to your feet this minute. I don't know you. You're a perfect stranger to me. God does know you. Isn't that right? You believe me to be his servant? With all your heart? If our Lord Jesus is raised from the dead, I testify the truth. And if the truth is if the truth is the truth, God's obligated to give the truth. You're suffering with high blood pressure. Isn't that right? That's right, raise up your hand. Here's another thing. You're not from here. You come from New York City, somewhere up in that country there. You come this way. You've been in a meeting before. You were in a meeting, and that was, I see Mrs. Brown, an old woman, standing. it was in a New York meeting. It was my meeting. And you were healed. And you had cancer, didn't you? And you're healed of high blood pressure now. Go on your own rejoicing. Jesus Christ makes you whole. You believe him to be the Son of God? Hallelujah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Have faith in God. 
Don't doubt. Believe all things. If you can believe it, God can do it. That little girl sitting there has kidney trouble, doesn't she? You're her grandmother, aren't you? There's the other one right behind you that has kidney trouble, too. Is that right? <laughs> You're the grandmother of the child. Put your hands over on him. Almighty God, I condemn that devil. Come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. They're babies. You leave them. Don't fear. Have faith. Believe. Lady sitting right there has a back trouble, don't you, lady? Sitting right here, right in there. Have a back trouble. Jesus Christ makes you whole now. You can go home. You don't have no prayer card or nothing else. You don't need any. Just go home and be well. Jesus Christ heals you. Sitting right here, you have, you have a kidney trouble also. A lady has heart trouble with it. That lady with a feather in her hat. Isn't that right, lady? A kidney and heart trouble. That's right. Raise up to your feet. You accept Jesus as your healer? It turns light around you. Now, how am I knowing these things? There stands that pillar of fire. It looks like, oh, you can see it's right above the lady's head. There it is, sitting there. Go home, lady. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and get well. Hallelujah. You see what I mean? It's nothing bogus. It's the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look and live. Believe with all your heart. What do you think about a lady sitting there with a red dress on you? There's a dark shadow between you and I. The Holy Spirit speaking to me. It's positive. It's true. You're a bottle with a nervous condition. Isn't that right? You're the, yes, sir. You know what it is? It's a change of life. It's menopause, or at least that's what your doctor said. That's right. Raise up your hand like this and shake it. That's right. You're healed. Jesus Christ makes you whole. Your face touched him like the woman with the healing garment. Oh, challenge your faith. Look and live. Praise be to God. There he goes, moving right over to this corner to the lady standing there. You got something wrong with your back, lady. It's in your spine. Stand up to your feet just a minute. I say it's in your back, it's in your spine. Isn't that right? You believe me to be God's prophet? You do? Doctor can't do nothing about that, can he? He tried, but he failed. There's nothing to be done. Here you might know I'm God's prophet. You are, you got a mother, and she has something wrong with her eyes. It's a cataract on her eyes. She's sitting in front of you. Isn't that right? It's your mother. Isn't that true? That's right. Say you answer, your name is uh, May. Your first name? Your last name's Hall, isn't it? Yes, sir. Don't you live 74 Broad Street here? All right, lay your hand over on your mother. Satan, you're defeated in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out of the woman. You think I'm crazy? I'm not. The Holy Spirit is here predominating. What do you think about that? You had your hand laying on her then, on your friend there, sitting next to her. You have headaches all the time, don't you? Stand up on your feet. You had your hand on the woman. I've seen the angel jump from her to you. Now, try. You have persistent headaches. Starts in the back of your neck. Coming up. It's just the time of life you're going through also. Don't worry about it. It's going to leave you. I'll see you later on. You're not, you're not, I ain't got nothing on your head then. You're all right. You're going to be well. Try. You believe it? I see you are going into a house for the number of 110. That's your, t- that's your number, 110. Moeller Street or something like that. Isn't that right? You answer the name of Alice, don't you? Raise up your hand and answer to Jesus Christ as his servant heals. Hallelujah! Do you believe him? Stand to your feet, every one of you right now. It's moving all over you. Everywhere except for healing right now. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, I cast out every unclean. 